All right, good morning, everyone. Just a joy to be here this morning and to share with you from God's Word. I'd like you, please, to turn with me the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. We're going to do two short readings this morning, actually very short, just one verse each. And then we'll, we'll be looking at a lot of other scriptures, but just by way of opening readings, I want to read from Matthew 2, verse 2, and then one from Genesis, chapter 3. So Matthew 2, verse 2 says this, saying... Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Second reading, Genesis 3 and verse 9. We'll talk about these two scriptures for a moment. Genesis 3 and verse 9. says, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? So it's kind of interesting. First reading that we read from Matthew 2 verse 2 is the first question asked in the New Testament. It's a great question. Where is he? In Genesis 3, 9, it's not the first question that is asked in the Old Testament. There's a couple more that are asked before this one. But they were asked by Satan, and we don't want to talk about him today. It's not his day today. This is the first question, Genesis 3, 9, that God asks in the Old Testament. Where are you? Kind of interesting, isn't it? Where is he? Where are you? And that's what we want to do this morning. We just want to look at those two simple questions. We're going to begin with, where is he? And I, I want to suggest to you that that question, where is he, did not end in Matthew chapter 2. In fact, I would suspect that in the 33 years that the Lord Jesus was on earth, people were constantly asking that question, where is he? Because word had got out, you see, about the miracles that he was doing and all. And everybody would be asking, where is he? In fact, I can prove that to you. Uh, if you would like some proof, I, I'd like us to just look at one particular verse. And that's in John's Gospel, chapter 11. John chapter 11. And I did say we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures. So I want to hear rustling pages this morning. Uh, because uh, it's going to be a good exercise in finding our way around the scripture. John 11, verse 55 through 57 it says, and the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then saw they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. And so you can see very clearly there, everybody's looking for him. His admirers were looking for him, and his adversaries were looking for him. Where is he? We want to find him. We've got to find him. Where is he? As we answer that question, where is he? We're going to kind of do a, a, a kind of a, an overview of that question. Where is he? And we're going to use a literary device just to help us a little bit. We're going to alliterate, and we're going to use the letter C. And there's going to be 14 Cs. Oh. Okay, so we'll still be done by, by 12 o'clock. I'm not saying AM or PM, oh. but we'll be done by 12 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like you to uh, at least uh, see if you can get all 14 of the Cs. And I'll try and be good and uh, give you a clue uh, that they're being said. Uh, but through this literary device, we're going to kind of have an overview of where the Lord Jesus would have been during those 33 years and even where he is now. I'm going to look at that question, and then we're going to focus on the second question, where are you? So to begin with, where is he? Well, let's begin with a very simple place, and that is he's in the cradle. Look at the gospel of Luke chapter 2. And verse 7, Luke's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 7. And of course, their wise men are asking this question, where is he? Uh, but when they're asking the question, where is he? 
uh, that is born king of the Jews. When they asked the question, Jesus was already born, right? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? He's already born. They want to know where is he now? So many believe that actually, and I, I hate to be the Grinch that stole Christmas, but you know the typical manger scene where you have the shepherds and then you've got the three wise men. Well, the three wise men, if there were three of them, I suspect there might have been more, did not show up for at least something up to two years. Okay, so we, we, we don't want to uh, just kind of get the, 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 the typical manger scene out of our minds. But he was born in a cradle. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and verse 7, it says, She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, again, very interesting little uh, scripture, isn't it? Uh, this uh, child, where is he that is born king of the Jews? The last thing you would expect of a king would be that he would be born in a cattle shed. That's an unusual place. And not just that, but in a cradle, in a manger. It's kind of interesting. And, and many, many believe, by the way, that this manger was actually made of stone, that they actually carved these uh, out of stone, and 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 that's what they would use to feed the cattle. And and if that is the case, and, and it just is interesting because at his birth, there's already a foreshadowing of his death, because you know he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, and 33 years later on, he's going to be wrapped in linen cloth and he's going to be laid in a cold tomb, and so right at his birth. There's a foreshadowing of his death. But again, we've got to ask ourselves, where is he? Where is the, the born king of the Jews? Why would he be born in such a lowly place? Well, maybe God is emphasizing something about this king. He's a very different kind of king. Often kings are pompous and proud and full of swagger. But he's a humble king. He's born in humility. Born in, in a lowly cattle feeding trough. And that's a, a wonderful thing to think of, isn't it? That this king is so different to any other king. One that is born in a mage, a humble king. Then let's go on now to the second one. He's born in a cradle. I hope you got that one. I'm making it really easy for you. This is, uh, let's go to Matthew again, please. Chapter two. <clears throat> Where is he? Because after his birth, no doubt, because the shepherds went everywhere telling what they had seen, right? I mean, they just couldn't keep it to themselves. They went everywhere spreading this good news. And so the question would be, well, where is he now? You see, where is this one that was born in a manger? Well, <clears throat> by the time the wise men arrive, we want to suggest to you he's in a cottage. It's not a palace. Scripture uses the term house. But I'm going to use that quaint term cottage because I suspect it was an Airbnb and it wasn't much a one. It was a small cottage. We're trying to bring it up to today's relevance. Chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, when they were come into the house, notice that, not the manger, into the house, they saw the young child. That term young child is not the word used for baby. It means up to two years of age. That's why, by the way, that Herod wanted to kill all the babies two years and under because he he, he figured it out. He, he probably could be a two-year-old, but we want to make sure we get him. So everybody two years and under. And so where is, come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary and his mother and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Again, just a lovely scripture. First of all, I, I love this scripture because of the precision of scripture. Because it's so important that we realize that when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. But notice it doesn't say they fell down and worshipped them. There's no idea of worshipping mother and child like a billion people tend to do today in that system called Roman Catholicism. No, none of that nonsense. Very specific. They worshipped him. Because only God is to be worshipped. Scripture is very clear on it. So isn't that interesting? So we've had his humility brought before us. 
Now we have his absolute deity brought before us. He is a king that is worthy of being worshipped, which means something different about this king. A lot of kings want to be worshipped and they want to be bowed down to and all the rest of it. But only God is worthy of worship. And this king is to be worshipped. Now, again, uh, he's humble. He's worthy of worship. But I want you to notice their gifts. And we're not going to get uh, spend a lot of time on these because that maybe for another occasion. But uh, they present to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. One thing I know is that myrrh was a burial ointment. It was used to anoint dead bodies. Now, I don't know how you would feel if, if you were at a baby shower for your baby and somebody shows up and brings a burial ointment for the baby. You'd say, that's a bit premature, isn't it? He just started his life. But the indication is this. This child was born to die. Right at the very outset. The indication is he came for a purpose. He came to die. He came to die for rebels and sinners. And so what kind of king is he? He's a holy one. He is worthy of worship. And he's a king who was born to die. Well, I'm sure that the combination of this caravan of wise men arriving in the city of Jerusalem and then going from there to Bethlehem would have caused quite a stir. And there would have been a, a big question, where is he that these have come to see? And it wouldn't have died out just after their visit. The shepherds already had glorified God, praising God for the things they had heard and seen. As it was told them, they'd gone around spreading this message. Now the arrival of this caravan of, of wise men. And so clearly that there's still this question is hanging in the air. Where is he? And again, it's a, an unlikely answer. Where, where is he? What's this king doing now? Well, look at Mark's gospel now, chapter six. In all places where you wouldn't expect to find a king, He's in a carpenter shop. That's number three. In a carpenter shop. In a cradle, in a cottage, in a carpenter shop. Mark 6, verse 3. We just read these simple words. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. A king in a carpenter shop. Who ever heard of such a thing? What kind of king is this? No one could ever accuse this king of living a life of privilege. Or not knowing what it is to do a day's work. All right, for you sat on your throne. You don't know what it is to do a day. Oh, yes, I do. He worked in a carpenter shop. And you wonder about what he made there in that carpenter shop. Of course, he was in... Nazareth, which was in Galilee of the Gentiles, Gentile territory. Lots of Roman settlements in that area, been to some of them. And, and so no doubt, uh, well, I'm sure he made a lot of yokes, you know, yokes for oxen. Mm -hmm. That's why when he wrote, take my yoke, I bet his yoke was the best yoke ever constructed by man. Don't you think? It would have been perfect for sure, wouldn't it? Because a perfect son of God would do something perfect every time. But not only that, one wonders if Joseph ever got any contracts from the Romans to make crucifixes. Mm. See, they did a lot of crucifixion. They said that there, it was, there were crucifixes all over the Roman Empire as they liked to make a spectacle of those that dared to resist the Roman power. We don't know. We can't be sure. But we do know this. He was a king who was known for hard work. Wasn't afraid of hard work. Worked in a carpenter shop. He's a different kind of king. And where is he next? Well, number four, he's in Capernaum. Look at Matthew's gospel now, chapter 11 and verse 23. And we learn something else. It's this, this one that was once working in a carpenter shop is now doing a different type of work. He's, he's, he's fixing things, things that only God could fix. 
And so we notice verse 23, it says, Thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And that interesting, by the way, that's a fascinating scripture. Matthew eleven twenty three 23 is just a fascinating scripture for several reasons. People say today, if there were just more miracles, more people would believe. No city ever saw more miracles than Capernaum. How did they respond? Did they all bow down and worship? No, they rejected him. The miracle worker of Galilee, who did all these miracles in Capernaum, and, and yet he says, you've been exalted to heaven. You will be brought down to hell for the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom. It would have remained till this day. In other words, they would have repented. The implication is you guys did not repent. Even though you saw all of that, no repentance. Amazing. So it's not more miracles that's going to convince people. Certainly didn't convince them then. What were some of the miracles? Look back at chapter 11, verse 15 of Matthew. Sorry, verse 5, 11, 5. It says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. What kind of works, mighty works were done? Well, these are pretty mighty works, aren't they? The blind receiving their sight, the lame walking, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. These are pretty significant miracles, aren't they? That they witnessed and rejected the evidence. And what we might say, though, from our perspective, we're just trying to find out what we can about this king. What kind of king is he? We've talked about his humility. We've talked about his hard work. We've talked about uh, the, the fact that uh, he <clears throat> was, well, we'd see it here. He's a compassionate king. No king was more compassionate than this king. The lepers being healed. They were. You talk about outsiders. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be around those guys. And yet he even touched them. Isn't that amazing? What compassion. And, and I could say this without hesitation today. There's no more compassionate person who cares for you more than this king, the Lord Jesus. Such is the greatness of his compassion. And it's so evident that he's a compassionate king. Where is he now? That was number four, by the way. Number five. Let's look at Matthew's gospel again, chapter 27. <clears throat> verse 36 through 38. He is on Calvary. That's where he is. As the savior of the world. We already read this verse this morning. Oh, no, we didn't. That's 26, 36. Here we did. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head this accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left hand. Where is he? He's in Calvary. Watching him there, a king on a cross, why, why would that happen? Why would a king be crucified? Well, it's simple. He was rejected. We will not have this man to reign over us. Just like today, people prefer to run their own lives. Today, it's just the same all across this continent, there are people who are still saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. They say, we don't have any king but Caesar. In other words, we'll take anybody, even Caesar. We don't want him. What a tragedy. And yet, this is all part of God's plan, isn't it? This is part of the divine plan. He, he came into the world for a purpose. He came to save sinners. The Son of God was manifested that he might take away our sin. And how did that happen? 
Well, he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He bore our sins in his own body on that tree. A savior king, a substitute king, one taking the place of his subjects and willingly dying in their place, in their stead, taking the judgment that they rightly deserved. Where is he? Well, he's now in a cold tomb. Look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. It's number six, cold tomb. It says, <clears throat> number six, Matthew 27, 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. Where is he? Well, he's in a tomb. Why is that significant? Well, the, the reason it's important that he's in this tomb is because in order to save us from our sin, he had to die. And the tomb is proof positive that he really died. You see, these Romans that were involved in this act of crucifixion, they were professional executors, executioners. That's what they did for a living. And what they knew a dead body when they saw one. They were sent to break the legs, remember, of those that were on the cross, and they, they broke the legs on one on either side of the Lord Jesus. But when they came to the one on the center cross, they realized he was dead already. Not, by the way, because the cross killed him. He says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. And remember, he dismissed his spirit. He died when he was ready to die. And he died, and the evidence was clear. Now, just to be doubly sure, that it's interesting how they didn't break his legs, which they'd done on the other two. You'd think that, I mean, they've done two. Why not go in for the three? <laughs> go in for the hat trick. All three of them, why not? Because scripture had said, not a bone of him will be broken. So they couldn't do that. So what did they do? They took a spear. They pierced his side, and blood and water came flowing out. That opened up a fountain, didn't it? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's maze. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains. Oh, how marvelous. He died. He was buried. He came to die. A king born to die. To die in the prime of his life. He came for that express purpose. to die in our place so where is he now look at the book of acts chapter one he's in the cloud ascending <laughs> now of course that presumes <clears throat> that he came alive again acts 1 verse 9 i love this verse it says and when he had spoken these things while they beheld See, at the cross, it says they watched him there, but now he's being watched again, isn't he? It says that when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And can you just imagine? They're just watching as the Lord Jesus literally ascends up in their very presence. By the way, you have to love the ascension. It's amazing. We don't make much about the ascension, but it's a, it's a wonderful truth. Yes, the one who died came back to life. He showed himself alive, we read in the book of Acts, to his disciples over 40 days, giving many infallible proofs. And then he ascended to the Father's right hand. What would that tell us? Well, it would tell us something about him being glorified, wouldn't it? And what a contrast, really. We'll look at number eight, and we'll tie seven and eight together. Where is he now? He's in the chief place of honor. Look at Hebrews chapter one, verse three. Hebrews chapter one, verse three. That was number eight, by the way, just in case. Hebrews one, verse three. I'm going to make it so easy for you to, to get passing grade on your test this morning. So I'm just being so 
just because it's Christmas Eve, I'm feeling kind of very generous, you know. So Hebrews 1 verse 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Where is he? You know where he is right now? He's seated on the right hand of God. Seated on God's throne, sit at my right hand. And again, just don't you just love that we said, why do we love the incarnation? Well, because he came into this world. Why do we love the ascension? Because he, having accomplished his work, he went back to his father. And, and just as we think about it, you, you, your mind comes immediately to, uh, to Psalm 24. See, down here, all he seemed to get at every point was rejection, rejection, rejection. No room for him at the end. Starts pretty early, doesn't it? <clears throat> Even in his own family, neither did his brethren believe on him. In Nazareth, when he preached his first sermon, as it were, in his own synagogue, what does it say? It says they tried to take him and throw him off a cliff. He goes to the city of the great king. We've already heard that we will not have this man to reign over us. And then the most ultimate rejection in those three hours of darkness. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Rejection, rejection, rejection. And now he's ascending on high. Oh, and what a contrast. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Why? The king of glory is coming in. Fresh from battle. Sit here at my right hand. They don't want you down here. <laughs> I want you here. You sit here at the place of, oh, isn't that wonderful? Praise God that he is now seated in the chief place of honor. Far above all principalities and powers, every name that is named, he's on the right hand. That place of honor. He's honored. Yet we still have to ask the question, where is he? Because although he's seated there on God's right hand, number nine, he's somewhere else as well. I suppose being God, he can be in more than one place at one time. And the book of Colossians tells us a really interesting place where he is. Colossians 1 verse 27, where is he? Colossians 1 27, it says this, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where is he? You're a believer this morning. He is in you. Right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. By the Spirit. Christ dwells in you. We love that hymn. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this, that Christ liveth in me. You're a temple. You're a living temple. Amazing to think about that. Where is he? He's in the Christian. He's in the Christian. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The one who has received him comes and lives within them. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. We've been singing that this morning. But where else is he? Can we still keep asking this question? Where is he? Well, number 10, he's in the center. Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I. In the midst of them. Isn't that wonderful? So this morning when we gathered, well, where was he? He was here. He was right in our midst. Not only is he in the Christian, but he's in the midst of his people when they come together in his name. Number 11, where is he? Well, he's coming quickly. Revelation 22 and verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Where is he? He's coming quickly. Where is he? 
Well, this has not happened yet, but it's going to happen. In fact, it's so certain that it's going to happen, that he'll be in this place, that God has already written it as if it's already happened. Book of Psalms, chapter 2, and verse 6. Where is he? He's crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the very place of his rejection. Psalm 2, verse 6, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Don't you just love that? He writes about the fact that Christ is going to reign in Jerusalem, that holy hill of Zion, the very place that he was rejected. And he writes about it as if it's already happened. Yet have I set my king. Despite man's rejection, despite man saying, uh, we don't want this man to reign over us. God says, I'm sorry, I've, my planet takes precedence. He is going to reign. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does. His successive journeys run. He will reign, and he's going to reign from the very place of his rejection. The very place where they said, away with him. We will not have this man. God says, I'm sorry, you will have this man. He will reign, and he will reign as king of kings. And Lord of Lords. Where is he? He is crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Where is he? Number 13. Let's go to Matthew 16 and verse 16. He is the common confession of every child of God. Where is he? Matthew 16, verse 16. I love this. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And every true believer loves to confess. I, I, I'm more and more impressed in this public confession. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mm. Oh, let us be quick to confess him. Let him be often and always on our lips. Now we've got one more left, but I want to ask the second question before I go to number 14. Because we've been asking, where is he? And we've been looking kind of at edited highlights of where he might have been found at different points in his history. Where is he? But now we want to ask the question, where are you? you see, when he asked Adam, Adam, where art thou? Do you think that God didn't know where he was? Obviously, he didn't have a GPS tracker on him or something like that. But God knows everything. God not only knew where he was geographically, he knew where he was spiritually. And what's amazing is God knows exactly where you are this morning geographically, but even more amazing is he knows where you're at spiritually so why did he ask the question if he already knew the answer why ask adam where are you if god knows where he is geographically and where he is spiritually well the reason he asked that question is because he's giving adam an opportunity to get honest with god about his true condition that's why he asked those questions isn't it he wants us to be real, to be honest. That's the one thing that God wants from us. Honesty in the inward parts. He wants us to be real. Reality. He wants us to be just real about where we're at. So I'm asking you the question, this: where are you this morning? You know, almost a year's gone by. Are you closer to the Lord than you were a year ago? Or have you drifted? You know, it's so easy to drift. It's like you almost don't even notice. But slowly but surely, we can drift away from the Lord, can't we? And so he's asking the question because he wants you to be to, an honest assessment. I don't want you to tell me. He doesn't want you to tell me. He wants you to tell him. The quietness of your, where are you? Where are you? Are you in a, a bit of a backslidden condition, maybe? Maybe some who will be listening to this, maybe they, 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 they're still saying in their hearts, <laughs> even though they're hearing lots of information, they're still saying we will not have this man to reign over us. 
Maybe some have never been saved that are going to hear this. And that's why this question, where are you, is so important. Where are you? See, he wants to have first place in our lives. See, the final question of where is he is that he is closer than you think. Look at Revelation 3 in verse 20. Of course, this is written primarily to a church and a church that is backslidden. And the Lord is seemingly in all their busyness and activity He's been squeezed out of the meeting place and he's outside the door. And so it says, behold, in the midst of all your activity and all your busyness, I'm standing at the door and knocking. He says, notice he's, he's speaking to a church, but he's now addressing the individual because churches are made up of individuals. And so he says, if any man, in other words, he's saying, is anybody in there listening to me? If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What he's saying is, I'm missing your fellowship. Isn't that amazing that he would miss our fellowship? In all the activity, that, that personal time of communion with him has been neglected and, and, and kind of it's Business as usual, all the activities continuing on, but but he is out of it because, because he's not the center of it. And so it'd be good to ask ourselves a question. Where are you? Because where he is, is knocking at your heart's door and saying, if you've drifted from me, I want you back. I want intimacy with you. I want fellowship with you. I long for communion with you. I want to sup with you. I want to just enjoy you. I made you for a purpose, to know me and love me. I, I made you for a purpose that we might enjoy communion together. That's why God is asking Adam, where is he? Because you see, normally they showed up and they walked together in the cool of the day. But one day, Adam didn't show up for the walk. He was hiding. And you see, it's easy, isn't it, to hide? To hide in our activity, our lack of intimacy. And so he's saying, where is he? He's closer than you think. Where are you? <laughs> That's the real question. And of course, for those that do not know the Lord, again, where are you? He's closer than you think. Romans chapter 10. I love this little scripture. Because it tells us how close the Lord is to anybody who has not trusted in him as their personal savior. Romans 10, and begin reading verse 8. It says, but what saith it? Notice this. The word is nigh thee, near you, close to you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Where is he? He's closer than you think. Right near. <laughs> All you have to do, just one call away, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that wonderful? How do we do that? Well, we've already said this before, haven't we? The ABCs, really simple. Admitting that I'm a sinner, because that's who he came to die for. He didn't come to call the righteous the sinners to repentance. Admit you're a sinner. And then believe that he came into this world to save sinners by dying on that cross that we talked about. Where is he? He's on Calvary. He's there as a sinner substitute. And he died and he was buried. He really died and he rose again. 
to believe that with all your heart and call upon him to save you. Simple as ABC. And yet opens up the greatest education a person could ever have. You see, if you don't get your ABCs, you won't get very far educationally. If you don't get the ABC of the gospel, you won't get very far either. But if you do learn your ABC, <laughs> admitting you're a sinner, believing Christ died, calling upon him to save you, it'll open up a whole new world of educational opportunities. The greatest educational opportunity of all is this. This is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It doesn't get better than that. So, as we conclude this morning, I said I'd done, be done by 12. You'd be happy to know it's 12 noon that we're done by. But we've got to ask the question. We know where he is. Where are you? Where are you? Are you in close communion with, with your Savior? Is it well with your soul? We often like to sing it. It is well, it is well with my soul. But we're good at say, singing things that may not be real. <laughs> so it's good to ask ourselves the question, where are you? Let's pray. Our Father, we, we're so thankful for just the, the wonderful truth that the Lord Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And Father, we're thankful that he's still in this age of grace, willing to save, able to save all that come to him through simple faith in what he did on Calvary. We pray if any were listening to this, never done that, that today they might close in on this opportunity of new life through Christ, new hope, new possibilities. But Father, we also recognize there are those of us that are saved. And the Lord might be speaking very clearly to us this morning by asking us this question. Where are you? Oh, Lord, we ask that each one might be in that place of happy fellowship, enjoying the Lord Jesus, intimacy with him, so that that person could say, nothing between my soul and the Savior. May that be the case for each one that is calls himself a Christian, that there might be nothing between their soul and the Savior. We'll give thee the glory and the praise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.